Welcome back. In today's video we're going to be showcasing and reviewing some of the submissions from our fellow builders. Every build you're going to see in today's video was submitted on the community post for our third episode in the bike build audits. You can look forward to seeing everything from the absolute budget beater builds to the meticulously handcrafted and customized beauties. I'll do my best to offer feedback and constructive criticism based off of my own experience in the hobby. Nothing I say is set in stone, so feel free to get a second opinion. And if you need help with a build, feel free to join the Discord server linked in the description. Up first is Drone Pilot 260 with a 49cc 4 stroke on a Huffy Lachlan. If you're interested in a similar build, links in the description for his video where he adds a bit of commentary about some of the obstacles he had to overcome. At the time of recording, the Huffy Lachlan is actually my favorite frame to recommend, especially to new builders who don't want to deal with any additional headaches. The all-steel frame is based off of the Huffy Cranbrook, which has proven itself to be relatively sturdy. The two main upgrades on the Lachlan versus the Cranbrook are the rim brakes and the rear derailleur. This makes it easier for new builders when mounting the rear sprocket. You don't have to deal with the coaster brake arm, clearance with the sprocket bolts hitting the arm, or readjusting your cup and cone bearings when you take off the arm. And the cherry on top is you're not stuck trying to tension two chains. You only have to worry about the motor chain tension. Our builder here decided to go with the four stroke, which is fine. It sounds like it's running well, but I wouldn't recommend it for new builders for the reason he ran into, which is the same thing I had to deal with on my first build. You have clearance issues with the cranks, so you can't pedal it unless you get a wider crank set. Installing the adapter for that on a Cranbrook is okay if you really know what you're doing, but it's a nightmare if it's the first time you ever tried to do it. I'm not getting into the whole two versus four stroke thing, I'm just making a recommendation for new builders. If it's your first one, go with the two stroke kits because you don't have to worry about any of that. They're a lot easier to mount and your pedal clearance is fine. Now for our builder here or anyone else considering the same style of build, there's a couple of things I'd like you to watch out for. Number one, he already removed the stock fenders. Good job, those things are a death trap. Uh, number two, for his situation specifically, because he can't pedal, uh, look into getting the heavy-duty clutch or the racing clutch if you haven't already. Since you can't pedal from a dead stop, you put a lot of stress on the stock clutch and they wear out pretty quick. I notice on his build he's using a thumb throttle on the left side with a very odd orientation. If that bothers you in the long run, you can just remove the shifter and move it to the left side so you can properly orientate your thumb throttle on the right side. Shifting will still work, it'll just be upside down. On this build he can't pedal anyway, so it shouldn't really matter, but if he ever does get the chain figured out, well, it's still pretty easy to use. And lastly, on the Huffy Lachlan, and any other bike that has aluminum wheels with rim brakes, keep a close eye on your rims. The aluminum's a softer metal and it doesn't last nearly as long, especially on motorized bikes. Little bits of rock and sand that gets embedded into the rubber of your brake pads will chew away at the aluminum over time. And never let the brake pads get down to bare metal. You gotta stay on top of that because it will near instantly destroy your rims. The wheel set that's included with the Lachlan, as far as I can tell, is fine. But if you ever do have to replace them, try and get steel rims. I have seen builders successfully adapt rotors to these bikes, but it's a bit advanced for new builders at the end of the day the rim brakes are just a lot easier to deal with if you're brand new and some of the adapters they sell for the rotor kits are outright dangerous so be careful if you try and adapt them Here we have Will's Wheels with what appears to be a Huffy Nelluso. It's basically a Cranbrook with an integrated rear rack. Will also adds some additional commentary to his video, so check him out if you'd like to know more about this build. For daily driver builds, rear racks and front baskets might seem obvious that they're convenient, but once you start actually using them, you'll never want to build without them. It appears that his kit came with an upgraded cast aluminum head for better cooling. If you get a good one, these are great because they're really cheap, but note some of the early renditions of these heads had problems, especially with the spark plug threads being all messed up, but he didn't mention any issues in his video, so I think he got a good one. When it comes to aftermarket heads improving cooling, it's not really the size that matters, it's the surface area. You can see the side slits on this particular head, which are what helps give it a little bit more surface area. Otherwise, it would just be a larger chunk of metal to heat up and cool down and wouldn't make much of a difference. We can see that at some point his seat stay tube snapped where the rack meets the frame. These racks are known to do this, they don't hold a lot of weight, 
Now, I'm not going to complain about his welds. Mine certainly don't look any better. I'm actually going to give him a compliment for adding a small gusset, which will probably prevent it from breaking there again. There's a lot going on with this build to tell us that this is a true daily driver, and he's not trying to fake it. A smaller 32 sprocket shows us he's putting some miles on this. No dust on the frame, fresh grease on the chain and rear wheel, fresh even wear patches on the tires. The fact that he's gone out of his way to very well secure the fenders to the frame, ensuring he doesn't have an incident down the road. The silencer is a pretty dead giveaway for a daily driver. Yeah, some people ride open pipes everywhere they go, but when you see a silencer on a bike, it's a pretty good bet that that person's riding it at least once a week. There's a handful of other subtle details about this build that show it's a true daily driver, but the reason why this is important, new builders run across somebody like this, they know they can ask him a question and get a pretty reliable answer. I wanted to showcase this one real quick from Mopad Diaries. We've got another build of his that we're going to spend most of our time on, but this is pretty cool. I've wanted to try one of these out. These fit really well on smaller BMX frames. Now, I think he had to weld on the adapter, but I do believe they sell these with clamp-on style adapters. I'm not sure. I haven't looked much into them, but it's really cool. A little tiny four-stroke off the side of the rear wheel. You can pretty much motorize anything with this kit. I'm also pretty surprised at the speeds he's able to reach on this thing. I wouldn't imagine it has much torque, but once you get up to cruising speed, I guess it doesn't really matter. I'd play the audio, but I don't know if the music's copyrighted, so you can check out his video linked in the description. Now, here is his build that I really wanted to showcase. I don't know anything about the bike. Basic cruiser appears to be all steel with smaller tubes, easier to work on. I'm digging the big front rack. But he's got a 49cc two-stroke on here, and as you know, we just did a video about one with ours on a Screaming Demon. And it was running okay, but his seems to be running a lot better. He recommended that I try the NT carburetor with a 62 jet, so I'm going to look into doing that here this weekend. All around, this build looks solid. He's got a massive front brake rotor on this thing. I think this is the first build I've ever seen use a brake rotor on Springer forks. I'm curious to know how that works when the forks compress, if it messes with the caliper at all. His exhaust appears to be a fat belly pipe with a welded on stock exhaust. I don't know if he gutted it or not, but let's listen to the bike because this thing sounds really smooth. The next two bikes we're going to be looking at are from NZ Motorized Bikes. I'm going to let the commentary in his video speak for itself for a couple of reasons. One, he quickly goes over both builds, adding just enough commentary without wasting any time. Two, one look at these bikes and you're going to know right away they put plenty of miles on them, or in his case, kilometers. And three, it's pretty clear that they know what they're doing riding these bikes out in the middle of nowhere and have done just enough to get away with it and keep them running. These two bikes are good examples of exactly what you can get away with to keep these things running if you know what you're doing. You can be on a super tight budget, that doesn't always matter. It also goes to show, myself included, how we can often overthink a lot of stuff in this hobby. In my defense, I love to experiment and see what makes a difference, but if you're just someone who loves to hop on a beater bike and go for a ride, well, here you go. So here we have two bikes ready for audit for LA hover bikes. We've got the first one here is a 50cc. We'll go over this one first. 36 tooth sprocket welded onto the hub. Then we've got a chain tensioner just before that. Then before, after this, we've got the CDI and uh, magneto setup down to the muffler, which has been adapted to fit onto this frame, along with the engine mounts have been too. Then we've got the standard 50cc jug with head on top. Uh, we've got a standard carburetor with an adapted intake to allow it to actually fit on this bike. Goes up to the spark plug there, which connects to the CDI. Then over the top here we have a small filter attached in line onto a 2 litre gas tank. Up to the handles here we have a thumb throttle with a rear brake, a bell, and a mirror. Then we also have onto the left hand side here we have a kill switch and a clutch broke off the other clutch and so I had to use the brake handle. So this bike's done approximately three and a half thousand kilometers so far. 
for roughly 20, uh, 2,000 miles. It's done pretty good mileage, had a few issues on the way, lots of things have fallen off and put back on, but in the end she still gets me where I'm going. Got a good tread on her, reliable, could use a wee bit more oil occasionally, but as you can see she's running pretty rich right now, a little bit dirty. And in the background over there, then we've got brand new 70cc, not quite brand new, with a standard 44 tooth sprocket mounted with the standard rubbers on the back with a simple chain tensioner on the front there. Moving up to the standard uh, CDI and, and magneto setup with a jug 70cc on a standard exhaust with a NT carburetor I believe. It's got the filter in there as well along with a decent spark plug, 2 litre gas tank. I get roughly 50 kilometres per tank in this one. Uh, we've got a clutch here with the button still on. We've got a front brake, a horn, a light that doesn't work, a simple fan. So we've got, we've got both gears. We have the front brake here, uh, the, right, the rear brake sorry, here, with the accelerator, kill switch, and the power set up on the front. Next up is KB United with a beautifully simple build that has a lot of potential. Starting with the frame, he has the best felt faker style that I know of. It's the same as the Zeta Dawn version 2 and the F-Zero. I have two of these and they've proven to be very reliable and sturdy. They're not perfect, I've seen a handful of people still have these crack on them in random places being all aluminum, but as far as the gas bike frames go, this is the strongest one I know of. The high rise handlebars with a wonderfully comfortable looking seat means this thing could cruise probably all day and not get sore. I'm guessing this is a bike you've pieced together yourself as the front forks don't look like what you would get from the F-Zero or Zeta Dawn. They have the clamping triple trees which are a lot safer in my opinion. Now anyone can get bad apples, but the Firestorm Zeta 80 is my favorite go-to motor. Good out-of-the-box performance and relatively reliable compared to other motors I've used. Not to mention, that's the same motor that we modified and reached 52 miles an hour on, so those things can scream if you want to push it. Decent steel rims with thick spokes matched up to some hookworms. Now the hookworms, from my experience, are not the best tires to use. It looks like you figured out the chain clearance issue, so good job, but they're kind of thin, so they can puncture really easy. If they ever do give you issues, look at the surface drifters. I see he's running the flex fit pipe. These are mostly for convenience and in some cases style. They don't do much to complement the two strokes, but they do offer a little bit of performance simply because they're less restrictive. The only major downside I find with a build like this is they can turn into a money pit if you decide to keep upgrading them. In short, if it's running good and you're happy, just be happy and ride it. The only recommendation that I'd keep an eye on is the bolts which hold on the sprocket and rotor for these wheels are known to back out quite easily, so keep an eye on them quite often, and if you haven't already, add some thread locker to those bolts. On to Nick's Bikes, one of our OG subscribers, been with us since the very beginning. Nick, I wanted to add you to the audit. But the lighting conditions, I just never really got a good look at your bike, buddy. However, you're here anyways because I get asked about building gas-electric hybrids all the time. And I like to point people to your channel because you've already learned a lot of the do's and don'ts about building them. Now, Nick has some good videos on it. And if you're curious about building a hybrid, check them out because it's not as simple as you think. Just slapping on all the components and going for a ride. There's a lot of things you don't think about when building the hybrid bikes that he's already gone through. So you can ask him questions, but definitely check it out. This build from Jared is what I believe to be his first motorized bike. Congratulations. He decided to go with a Phantom 85, and I know what some of you are thinking, but don't hate on him because he probably didn't know. As far as the build goes, I don't see any red flags. Fuel filter's on backwards, but that's a normal mistake for new builders. Just leave it like it is, don't turn it around, or else you'll dump all that junk into your carburetor. It'll be fine. All I can say for my fellow builder here is I hope it's still running and not giving you any problems, because the Phantom 85s have a very high failure rate. Unless they've recently done something to overhaul the jug and piston, 
they almost all die. My first one exploded, the second one had issues, I replaced the piston and sent it off to Pulsar 2121 so he could do some thorough testing on it, and it overheated on him and died too. Video's linked in the description if you want to see his series on the Phantom 85. Luckily, if it does give you issues, they do have replacement parts available for it now, jugs, pistons, exhaust, but if you're a new builder, stay away from the Phantom 85. These things are a disaster. I might revisit it someday if I hear that they've fixed the critical issues of the pistons breaking, snagging rings on the ports, and overheating, but until then, I'm not touching these. Moses returns once again with a drop-dead gorgeous Deadpool-themed bike, which is a work of art and performance. I highly recommend checking him out if you're into performance build, linked in the description. He covers everything on this bike, including parts. But I would like to point out one very interesting thing that you won't catch unless he tells you. This entire frame is anodized black, not painted. The lengths this man will go to get the exact build that he wants is amazing. Now, uh, I believe it's a work in progress, not finished. I don't know if he ever finishes his bikes, but I'll tell you what, they look great along the way. The beefy felt faker style frames matched up with a Piaggio. I don't know anything about these other than they're supposed to be powerful. Complete CNC machine bottom end as well. Now I'll admit, Moses, I got some catching up to do on that clutch system you've been working on. I plan on binge watching your series about it. But from what I understand is he's designed some custom parts to fit this unique clutch system to the bike. Arguably overkill for the performance that motor can put out, but I mean when it looks this good and you've gone to such great lengths to make it work, who cares? If you do watch his video, you'll hear him talk about the header length on his exhaust system. In a nutshell, he's deciding whether or not to go with a shorter header or keep it as is. And I believe that the longer header would give him more bottom end, maybe mid-range performance. And if he shortens up the pipe, it'll give him more top end. Just in case you're curious for some of the newbies. Of course, he's on a level beyond me, so take it for what it's worth. He also mentions he's running some pit bike wheels. Uh, I would love to know where you guys get these. I'm sure they're expensive, but probably worth it. If anything, I could say watch out for that front fork when you brake hard. Uh, I've seen, uh, what was it, Ryan, uh, RDM. Remember, he braked really hard on a fork similar to that and uh, snapped it. So just be careful, buddy. I don't want to see you get hurt. I'm sure you know what you're doing, though. Uh, one question for you while you're here, though. Uh, when you anodize aluminum parts, do you need to polish them for best results when it comes to durability, or is it just for aesthetics? I really don't know anything about it, but I have been curious about anodizing a few aluminum parts. In contrast to the last build, here we have Matthew with a nice little beater setup. He said this frame's from the 80s. He said mountain bike, I say road bike, but it could be either. I don't know, things were weird back then. But if you find an all-steel frame from about four decades ago that's still in decent conditions, grab it. These make great throw-together bikes. Sure, they're no thrills and they're a bit of a bear to ride off the pavement, but they ride and they hold together quite well. I'm really glad to see you went out of your way to put a left side mirror on the bike. Even if it's just a junker, those things are valuable when it comes to safety. I'm sure the comment section of your video has already screamed at you about the fender, so you know what to do. I recommend taking them off or, at the very least, reinforcing them. Here we have Bex Bikes, and he's got something special that some of you might want to keep an eye on. The heart of his build's got one heck of a power plant, which should run really nice. He's got the Athena cylinder, which shouldn't give him any problems with heat seizures. He's got a CNC Smolik Performance bottom end and head, along with a Makuni VM20 carburetor. To help complement this demon heart of a motor, he's got a KX60 pipe. Now, I'm not an expert when it comes to pipe. I don't know how well matched that is to this motor, but it should be around the same size, so there'll be some performance gain for sure. Almost everything he talks about for this planned build is great. He's going to upgrade the forks to some triple trees, get some Gemini wheels. You know that's my personal favorite when it comes to investing in performance build. The Geminis are fantastic, and it's not like you're stuck with them on one bike. You can move them around. My biggest concern is the actual frame itself. If you can squeeze in the budget for a felt faker style like the F0, the Zeta Dom, the same thing Moses is using, the same thing I use, it's a lot beefier of a frame that's going to be able to handle that power safer. 
I'm concerned about the rear dropouts. You're going to be pushing a lot of power through this relatively flimsy aluminum gas bike frame. These are something that you build as a convenient cruiser. I don't like seeing high power pushed on these skinny frames. Now, feel free to get a second opinion. I think there's some big names that run these frames, but I, I don't know how much you can trust those rear dropouts to hold that much power. Those Athenas are no joke, so be careful, and I can't wait to see this thing built. Moving on to Cassie, a.k.a. Grumpy Killer. He's got a fat moto for us. Now, I know it's a pre-built, but he's done some things to make it his own. Those wide street tires give this a real old-school motorcycle look. I really like that. And even though I'm not a big four-stroke guy, this thing sounds amazing. That custom pipe you put on there gives it a killer wah-wah sound. The idle just, it's really unique. I really wish Fat Moto would offer these frames sold by themselves, because I I could do a lot with one of these. They gusset their frames, have integrated chain tensioners, a lot of unique things that complement motorized bikes, but they just won't offer it. It's four-stroke only pre-built as far as I know, unless they've recently changed something. I don't know what model this is, what year it is. He probably said in the video, I just had to go through a lot of these. But you know, on their frames, they add gussets, and these do a lot to strengthen the frame and just make them last longer. Early Fat Motos, from what I could see, had a lot of issues with their jack shafts, bearings giving them grief, and the transmissions falling apart. But I think they've mostly figured it out, and the latest models, I don't see a lot of complaints about them when I look at reviews. Now, being a pre-built, and they're a business, they have to make money somehow, these Fat Motos, they come in at the price range of decent electric bikes so it's a real thing you got to try and weigh what's the advantage having the four stroke gas build or the silent electrics that's completely up to you guys but when it comes to pre-built with decent quality you're going to be in the electric price range i know if this was my build i'd get a left side mirror and a suspension seat post that would really smooth this thing out, especially since you've already got the fat tires. They complement each other really well. But it's good to finally see a fat moto in one of the audience, so thanks for the submission. A nice basic throw together from Ashton. Although it's a bike that's shown some love and is clearly used, it's relatively clean. Everything about this clip screams gravel bike. From the knobby tire sitting on top of gravel, to the gray color scheme, and the gravel dust all over the build. It's pretty clear he runs this quite a bit and has some fun with it. You can see him rocking the massive 4 liter tank, probably overkill for this build unless you really put some miles on it. He says the motor is a Skyhawk, and I've heard a lot of good things about these. I don't think I've ever come across any real big complaints about the Skyhawk motors. They're pretty basic, but they're good runners. He's got the basic fat belly pipe on it. Now, I've tested these up against the WC80 and Bikeberry Deluxe. And they give more bottom and mid-range power. The Deluxe Pipes gives a little bit more top in. How he runs this bike, I assume this is a pretty good match for a decent price. Most of the power gains from this pipe is from the simple fact that it's opened up and less restrictive, but the expansion chamber from my testing does do a little bit for the bottom end. I haven't talked much about the spring chain tensioners that's been used on a few of the builds in this audit. You can see he's using one on this build. It's important to note that not all frames complement the spring tensioner. Some don't have room for it. If you have a trail or mountain bike setup where the rear tire is really close to the seat tube, you usually can't get away with using the spring tensioner. But you can see his rear tire gives him plenty of space and it's the same on builds like the Huffy Lachlan and the Huffy Cranbrook. Most cruisers can use the spring tensioners, but most modern trail and mountain bikes can't get away with it. Thank you so much to everyone who submitted for the community audit. Whether your build was budget or extreme, you've probably helped out somebody watching this video, whether you realize it or not. So, good job. I hope you guys got some useful information out of today's video, or at the very least, were mildly entertained. And until next time, ride safe.